weather this year. Everything was up. So uh, I want to say thanks again to everybody, but especially to Harry and Mike. Speaking of Mike, yeah, all right, let's applause. Go ahead. I think it's great. Because how do you think we pay for this food? <laughs> yeah, okay. Winterfest. All right, so all of you in the back, uh, grab your food and come on up here because you need to know how to be safe in your shack. And speaking of Mike, W-A-8-A-H-Z, he's going to tell us a little bit about things that we can do to make our lives safer while we enjoy this hobby. Thanks, Bill. And a couple of administrative things. If you haven't signed up on the roster, we'd appreciate you doing that. Uh, you notice we did something a little bit different this time. The roster had the guests and visitors first. That way we might get a chance of capturing them on the sheet and then everybody's stuff behind that. So uh, uh, thanks to the new members uh, and thanks to the visitors for signing in today. Does anybody need the sign-in roster? Okay, uh, Bill will take care of that, uh, but I, I think we're short a few sign-ins. Yeah, I'd rather use that. <laughs> so I am not going to use the view graph machine because frankly uh, my take is you couldn't see the view graph machine from the third row back but more importantly I'm passing around a, uh, a handout the handout is uh, front and back one page it's a checklist and I think of grounding as a checklist item now uh, I may have under uh, Xerox copies of this uh, if you go to the website go to meetings go to presentations so go to the website go to meetings on the main menu and under meetings the first drop down box is presentations the presentations will be there uh, when we leave today that reminds me George where are you uh, George where are you can you make sure your slides get sent to me or Doug so we can put it up on the website, please? Or Leon, somebody send them to me or Doug and we'll get them up on the website. We'll also put the, uh, the live stream link so that if you want to listen to this again, you can. And Jason, uh, Jessica, just approximately, how many people are, are in on the uh, live stream? Three. Okay, so right now there's three people doing the live stream. That's pretty cool. Uh, a couple weeks ago we had 11 people. So, and the average is closer to four or five. So this is a boring topic. People didn't want to listen to it. Okay, what is this thing about electrical safety about? It's springtime. It's a good time to clean the shack. It's a good time to think about grounding and bonding. And that's what we're going to be talking about today. And so the first checklist item basically says if you've got metal non-current carrying parts in your shack okay you've got a transceiver the transceiver has a metal outer cover metal non-current carrying parts the rule book says in the national electrical code that all metal non-current carrying parts should be bonded together how do you bond it together well my preference would be that you bond it with a copper uh, uh, wide strap because that gives you not only electrical safety, but RF control. And what do you do? You bond the grounding lug of the transceiver to the grounding lug of the tuner, if you have one, uh, to the uh, uh, grounding lug on the uh, power supply, if you have a grounding lug on the power supply. That bonds all these metal non-current carrying parts together. Why do you do that? very simply should you be using your left hand and you be tuning for example your transceiver and at the same time pushing the tune button on your uh, tuner if those two metal non-current carrying parts are a different voltage what does different voltage mean with regards to current uh, possibly through your heart and by the way it only takes about 50 milliamps of electrical current uh, at least AC current to uh, begin the onset of, uh, of uh, a heart attack uh, if you will atrial fibrillation 
And that's what this is about. The only purpose of this bonding conductor is to make sure that the voltage of all these devices are the same. Now, there are some of us who would say, you're not done yet, partner. Just because you've tied these metal non-current carrying parts together, there's more to the grounding story. But if you do nothing else in your spring cleaning, bond your devices together. First question. So, what does that give you additional over your, the electrical safety ground we all have with our free wire plug? Okay, that's pretty good, good uh, ad lib because that's going to come into the next checklist item. So the question was, why do you need to do this? Because if everything is plugged into your AC ground, haven't you achieved the same purpose? Well, let me ask a question. The show of hands in the room. How many people have a separate power supply for your tuner compared to your transceiver? Because you want to keep your tuner energized in order to hold the memory locations. I'm one of those guys, OK? Now, have you ever looked at the power supply that you're using? It's probably uh, a, uh, something that you'd use for, I mean, it's only like, what, three milliamps or something you need. So you could use like a, uh, a charger type of power supply, right? You ever looked on the back of that power supply, that small little thing that you call a charger, and notice that it's non-polarized? That is to say, you can plug it into the electrical outlet this way or upside down. Okay, how do you establish the electrical ground on your tuner power supply separate from your DC power supply that you're using for your transceiver? I will tell you that if you bond all these devices together, I don't care how you do this, they'll all be the same voltage, whatever that is. Now, it turns out that these small little power supplies that you buy at Radio Shack, 12 volts, be able to plug your tuner into it, uh, it's what's called an intrinsically safe device. It doesn't have enough electrical current generated to cause, if you will, 50 milliamps of power current to go through it. That's the good news. The bad news is, uh, my opinion is, that is your weakest link if you have that uh, separate power supply. Um, one, one other question the same way. Wait a minute. Why do I have to bond these things together? My antenna coax connector is connected to my transceiver, is connected to my tuner. Doesn't that intrinsically bond these two devices? Yes. But your antenna outer shield doesn't tie to your power supply, does it? You want the power supply, the tuner, and the transceiver all intrinsically tied together. What about the question if your uh, power supply doesn't have a grounding lug? Many don't. Say what? Screw. Chassis screw? Yes. Okay. Uh, you can take it to a, uh, if you will, the chassis screw. That'll work. Uh, you could actually turn it to the negative. Well, okay, next thing is, let me ask you a question. Have you ever looked at the electrical plug that you plug your power supply into the AC outlet? Is it a three-pronged device or is it a two-pronged device? I'm going to guess it's three-prong. Because it's three-prong, NEMA, the National Electrical Manufacturers Association, says that the grounding conductor, the AC grounding conductor in that plug, must tie to the chassis of that device. I don't care if you're a power supply or if you're a radio or a TV or whatever. If it's got three plugs, uh, three, uh, three individual prongs, the grounding prong has to tie to the chassis. Now you tie the chassis to the DC power supply intrinsically. That's what the manufacturer is required to do. So my grounding solution, my bonding solution is transceiver ground, tuner ground. Both of those are lugs on the back of the uh, device to the negative of the power supply, which then is plugged into the wall. Now I know that I, if you will, if I touch my radio and I touch the lamp, and the lamp is plugged into the AC power supply, if there's, a metal, if there's metal parts on that lamp, it's going to be intrinsically the same voltage as my radio is. Remember, this is all about voltage control. Okay, so that's number one. Number two was on this checklist. <coughs> Look at your power supply and see if it's three prongs. If it's not, I really encourage you to go buy a new power supply, okay? Uh, old people with old vintage radios, good luck, 
Okay. To the wish. Well, but let's talk about that. If your house has been built since 1956, you probably do. If your house hasn't been built uh, prior to 1956, you probably don't have an effective grounding system in your house. Uh, maybe you do, maybe you don't. Maybe you've rewired, maybe you haven't. Uh, good luck on that. But effectively, most modern houses will have a, a grounding system as part of the uh, power supply. By the way, have you ever looked at that plug that you plug into the wall, that three-prong plug? There's three prongs, right? One of them is a little bit bigger than the other. Okay, this is what's called a polarized plug. All the circuits are set up the same way. The black wire of your AC wiring system is on one side. All throughout the house, it's on the side with the larger stab, which is what that's called. And that way, you're, you are polarized. Black wire is going to the hot. The neutral, the white wire, is the skinnier one. If you look at that three-prong plug, which is the uh, electrical uh, uh, device, if you ever notice that the uh, green wire, if you will, the wire that's associated with the grounding conductor, is physically longer than the other two connectors. You ever wondered about that and why? Sure. sure. The answer to the question was, was make sure that as you plug in the device, the first thing that gets established is your ground connection. The last thing that comes out is the ground connection. Okay? Made purposely that way. There was a question in the back of the room, I think. And I just got to rewiring. The smaller plug the ground is the hot black yes. wire. Yep. The larger one is white. <coughs> okay. Uh, That's that interesting. I'll have to go back and look at that. That's not what I thought. But anyway, one of those two wires are it's uh, consistently the same. The question or the comment that came in the room was uh, the code says the black wire goes to the smaller stab, the neutral goes to the larger stab. Uh, I'll stand corrected. I don't really care as long as it's consistent throughout the house. The code enforcer would be concerned about things like that. Okay, uh, what about this three-prong pluggy business? Should the ground be on top or should the ground be on the bottom? Aesthetically, it looks better on the bottom. Okay, why safety on the top? So the comment was, if there's a falling metal part, this is spoken by a guy who's a metal worker, okay, that if it should fall onto the plug while you're unplugging it, ooh, that's a low probability, but okay. Okay. Yep, so the bottom line is, let it hit the ground conductor before it hits, if you will, the hot conductor, the black wire, white wire. You know, when I was a kid, I used to pull the plug a little bit out, and I'd take my little crystal radio, and I'd tie my little crystal radio to the neutral, the white wire. It never really worked well when I touched it to the black wire. And it really never worked well when the alligator clip fell over the both the hot and the uh, neutral. I'll tell you it's the other way around. The ground's on the bottom. The reason you grab the connector and you pull the connector out, yeah. Your finger is going to hit the ground connector first. If it's reversed, oh. you pull the thing out, and your finger is going to be across the line in neutral. Yeah, there's, this, this is that. actually an electrician's debate. Uh, in hospitals, the hospital standard is different than the residential standard, and uh, you'll see it both ways. Well, let's go back to our checklist. So we've talked about electrical safety in the shack, and we said we've bonded all the electrical non-current carrying parts together. Uh, we checked our power supply and it's a three power plug. We've actually extended our bonding conductor to the power supply, either to the power supply grounding lug if there is one, to the chassis, or to the negative, uh, negative uh, terminal. Now if you're not sure what your power supply is doing, take an ohmmeter. Unplug your power supply first, please. But just go check continuity between the neutral conductor and the chassis of the power supply. And then also check it against the uh, negative uh, connector. 
and as long as you get zero ohms, you have continuity. Uh, it is the way NEMA would expect it to be. Bond all those pieces together. Well, if you keep reading down my checklist, I introduced something called the single point grounding panel. The single point grounding panel is a, is a, uh, a manifestation of ham radio operators. It's not something in the National Electrical Code. But basically what it says is you want a place where everything is physically tied to. If you ever go to, Ron, uh, to Doug uh, Reese's house, outside of his house at the chimney is a panel. And all of his antennas come into this panel. All of the surge protector devices are mounted on that panel. That metal panel that is, he has internally to there is a copper grounded plane, which is uh, tied to two different ground rods, if I remember right. And that's his single point of ground. And that single point of ground is physically outside of the house, inside of a waterproof panel. That would be what amateur radio operators strive for. My single point grounding system is a great big uh, washer uh, that is uh, two washers tied together with a bolt. And all my grounds come to that single point grounding system. And it's in the crawl space of my attic. And it's all tied together really nicely. And it works very well. But it's a single point where all my grounds come together. And they'll, that ground. All those come together from a, in a star type arrangement. Then they go down to a ground rod that I anoint and call my station ground. And I have the shortest length of uh, grounding wire that I can possibly have between that single point grounding system and earth where I've run my ground rods. I have two ground rods. The two ground rods are spaced eight feet apart. Why? Because each ground rod is about, excuse me, they're spaced 16 feet apart. Two lengths of my ground rod. My ground rod is eight. I just laid out a ground rod, laid out another ground rod. The second one was 16 feet away. So I have two grounds as part of my station ground. Now that might be a little bit overkill. Uh, if I ever get to that point, uh, which I won't given the time, and start talking about RF grounds, there's an argument that says, you're better off with four foot grounds instead of eight foot grounds. But from an electrical safety point of view, where I'm really now not so much worried about bonding the system in order to have no inherent voltage between metal non-carrying parts, but should there ever be a short circuit, an electrical short circuit where things touch together, I want that electrical short circuit current to go away from me and either into the house grounding system back to the service entrance or to my station ground. And actually, I'd prefer to go to my station ground. And the reason for that is I'm going to be tying my station ground to my antenna ground. And I'm going to introduce that topic next. So station ground is tied to your radio through a piece of wire that runs from your radio to that ground rod, or ground rods, plural. Uh, the the uh, National Electrical Code does not speak to having a station ground. <laughs> this is more of a manifestation of ham radio operators. Now, to be code, <laughs> excuse me, to be code enforced, the station ground should be bonded to the house ground. And if I was really being correct here, these ground rods are really called grounding electrodes. And the grounding electrodes are tied to this single point grounding plane through something called the grounding electroconductor. Now, this ground rod uh, is a piece of copper. You can buy a piece of plumbing copper if you want. Uh, frankly, I think a copper ground rod is a little bit cheaper uh, and easier to run into the ground. Hard to get out. If you ever want to pull a ground rod out, there's a couple of us that have ground rod pullers. Uh, don't try to do it without a ground rod puller. And once you put that in the ground, don't expect it to ever get out, uh, particularly if you drive it the whole eight feet. So the next part of this, let's see, where does it say that? It's about, uh, um, yeah, it's about the seventh thing down. Bond the station grounding electrode to the service entrance grounding electrode using number six American wire gauge. OK, so tie those two together. Now, I cheat. Uh, I happen to have a hose bib right where my station ground is. Uh, I checked the continuity, and that hose bib is all metal. There's no plastic in it. 
and it goes back to my AC ground. And so literally what I did was I jumped onto the piping system for my, quote, bond. And I bonded back to my service entrance through the cold water piping system. That's not right code-wise, but frankly, I'm a ham radio operator. I get to do things the way I want to. <laughs> now, how did I know this was all grounded when I was all done? Well, this is simple. I went to my single point grounding system. I took my ohm meter and I stuck it into the uh, AC power ground connector and I got zero ohms. So therefore I know that my station ground, my house ground, and my radios are all being serviced by not only my station ground, but my house ground. And the reason I want to do that is I really want all the short circuit current to eventually get back to the service entrance. Because my protective device system, my circuit breakers or fuses, depend upon the current going out and the current coming back in such a way that the service, uh, service protectors, uh, the service conductors uh, are protected from ground fault. And ground fault just means lots of current. In a typical house, you, what, you, you might have a 200 amp main uh, you can have up to 10,000 amps of possible short circuit current. And that occurs when you have a short circuit, a piece of metal that goes between that black wire and that white wire. Or you have a broken radio where you have an internal short circuit current. Now, those don't happen often, but crazy kids who put crystal radios on their uh, antennas using the power line, uh, they can cause strange things to happen. So I could stop right here and say to have a safe shack, uh, shack, bond all your metal parts, tie that bond, uh, tie that bonding conductor to a single, uh, single uh, ground point. Theoretically, you should put your computer, your telephone, everything else to that, and tie that to a ground rod that's as close to your shack as you can get. That's all it is. Now, there's more to this story, if you'll let me continue. But Mike, before I do, yes, sir. Does the length of the grounding wire from single point to all the different components matter? Can you repeat the question? <coughs> I did hear the question repeated. Does the length of the grounding a ribbon from the single point to the multiple components <coughs> matter? So the length the question is, what about length? I'm on the second floor, second floor so that ground rod that grounding conductor is, is 20, 25 feet long. Well, from a, quote, electrical safety point of view, the shortest possible is best, but I don't really care because I'm talking really about DC or AC at 60 hertz. Now, if I'm talking about RFI issues in the shack, where I'm talking about maybe 7, 15, 20 megahertz, uh, a 20 foot length of wire has a tremendous amount of impedance. Impedance, not resistance. Okay? So the short answer is as long as you make that wire at least number 10 AWG, let me make sure that's what I recommended. Yeah, number 10 AWG copper stranded. Okay, as long as you make it one size wire size larger than your house wiring, you, your inherent um, resistance is going to be lower than the rest of your house wiring and the electrical currents are going to want to go to the service ground and then remember your station ground is going to tie to the service ground and so uh, as long as you do that I don't care because I'm an electrical power engineer and I only consider uh, currents at 60 hertz or DC but the HF, uh, the RFI guys in the room would get a little bit antsy and say, uh, 20 feet's like huge amount of impedance. Nothing's going to flow there. Now, they make a device called an artificial ground. Save your money. Okay. Uh, between the bus bar you put behind your shack and the ribbon cables running to... Well, then, now you're talking to RF stuff. That, RF that's stuff. exactly... And I'm not going to get to that today. If you c invite me back someday, we'll go on to this lecture. But I'm not done. Wait a minute. More questions in the room. Brandon. 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 So I'm in a first floor condo, and I can't, I have everything you're talking about except for tying into the house electrical well. 
I just can't get to it physically. Sure. I'd have to dig under the building. That's not happening. I'd have to run yep. 300 feet around the building. That's not mm -hmm. happening. Um, tying into an electrical outlet? Yep. It's fine? Yep. Same thing? It's, it's good. I know people yeah. that physically take uh, and buy a three-prong plug and only put one wire in the three-prong uh, plug, a, quote, green wire. They connect it to the grounding plug, right? And they use that and tie that to their single point grounding system. Well, that goes to the building service centers. Well, remember, you said you couldn't. Yeah, your AC ground system. Yeah. I, the, yeah. There's always compromises in this business of grounding. If you do nothing else and you just tie the pieces of electrical equipment, non metal car carrying parts together. I'm a happy puppy. You've walked out of this lecture with a with a B. But if you want the A, you tie it to a quote station ground and you tie the station ground to the service entrance so that you have two paths that come back together. Because what's the resistance of two wires in parallel? What no. What well, two two wires in parallel, what's the resistance of the of the two wires? What's the resistance of two 100 ohm resistors in parallel? 50 ohms, right? Whenever you put two wires in parallel, the impedance or the resistance drops. That's that's the key thing here. Okay. About parallel as in connected. Yeah. In parallel rather than running parallel to each other and never touching. Yeah. Well, remember, I'm what I'm saying is you have your ground that's going to go through the AC ground system. And you've got a ground that goes through the service, your station ground, to the service entrance. So those are effectively two, uh, two paths of electrical current. Uh, back to that first. You. Oh, me? Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, I, you know, the only, only comment about that is that uh, if you depend on the house wiring for that and the grounds for that, those have been daisy chained to any arbitrary number of outlets depending on how they wired the house. So you got at best number 12 wire for that stuff, maybe 14 wire with uh, That's the best you can do. done through the outlets and stuff. Right. right. So, so those are not exactly what I call my most robust grounding gap. I don't know what else I do in a lot of Right, it's compromised. It it's is better than nothing. Okay. Back of the room. So have you measured any current that flows between your iron pipes that come into the house and the copper rod that goes into the ground? Well, AC or DC? The question is, is there an inherent electrical current if you have an iron water pipe and a copper uh, grounding system? Yeah, that's a trick question because the answer is yes. You have a cathodic current that flows, uh, a dissimilar metal current that flows between two different metals in the ground. So the short answer is yes. You know, by the way, I also taught a corrosion course when I was a kid. Uh, I taught at the university level for about seven years, and I taught power systems and corrosion control. So that's a tricky question. <coughs> uh, but the short answer is yes, there is an electrical current that flows between dissimilar metals. But the real question is, should you rely on your, quote, water piping system as your only ground? Well, somewhere in the 1960s, the National Electrical Code said you cannot, uh, you cannot depend upon your water system as your only ground. And in fact, in Fairfax County, the county code says that you have to have two ground rods at your service entrance. And guess what? They've got to be about 16 feet apart, two lengths of the eight-foot rod apart. Uh, John. Have you ever measured during an electrical storm? No, I wouldn't even do that. that. Measure the voltage on your ground system. Well, that's an interesting question. Measure your voltage on their grounding system. Okay, now comes the unique question. We don't have the time to go in this, but w now we're going to get into the topic of lightning protection. So I started by saying I want to protect you, a people, against yourself and the crazy things you do in your radio shack. And I said, bond your stuff together if it's metal current carrying parts. Protect yourself so that if you're touching your radio and you're touching a lamp, that you don't fry yourself. Okay, I'm going to take just a few minutes before we quit to make sure that I, I cover something that's called wire antenna uh, grounding. So if you will, 
jumping to the third major paragraph, lightning protection, wire antennas, and trees. So the first comment everybody tells me at field day is, huh, all these antennas are below the crown of the trees. Why do I have to worry about this lightning protection stuff? The lightning protection, the lightning's going to hit the trees. It's not going to hit the wire. Doug, you want to give a quick uh, vignette about your wire antenna that was below the crown of the trees that uh, vaporized one day? My uh, antenna was hit. It was below the uh, tops of the nearby trees. Uh, all that was left of the antenna were shards of insulation on the lawn. <laughs> okay, so uh, why it does hit things below the tree level. In fact, uh, I will tell you that it's, it's the bigger problem is not the potential of a bolt of lightning hitting, hitting your wire antenna. But your wire antenna is what? A resident at a frequency? 7 megahertz maybe? Okay, a 40 meter antenna, 7 megahertz. While we think of lightning as a, a strike, a bolt that has a very high rise time and is, quote, DC, direct current. Actually, if you look not at the time domain, but the frequency domain uh, for your analysis of a lightning strike, uh, the frequencies that are generated by the lightning activity, 5, 10, 15, 20 miles away, is anywhere from DC up to easily uh, 5, 6 megahertz. Mm, pretty close to a resonant antenna that is trying to eke out this little signal can pick up a whole lot of energy that's associated with, a, with lightning activity. So not only do direct strikes happen to be a, a problem to your wire antenna, but even nearby lightning storms. So uh, what's the first thing one should do if one has a wire antenna and lives in D.C. where you have essentially 40 to 50 days a year of thunderstorm activity. Unplug your antenna. Okay, well I put that all the way on the back page so that forced you to see that there was a back page that says as the very last bottom line, install a manual or automatic antenna disconnect means. Well my manual method is I unscrew it, I put it in a coffee cup because a coffee cup is porcelain and I put the uh, coffee cup in my waste paper basket which is metal, a Faraday cage. And I oftentimes go in after you, John, you said, do you ever measure the voltage on the ground around a lightning strike? By the way, be very careful when that's doing that. Uh, but the other thing is I collect the amount of electrons that are in my coffee cup after the lightning storm. <laughs> disconnect the antenna. Now, preferably, you should disconnect the antenna outside of the house because you don't want that stuff floating around inside the house. And worse, you don't want it floating around in a coffee cup inside of a aluminum, uh, thinking that would be a Faraday cage, aluminum uh, uh, waste paper basket. Disconnect it outside. Well, that's damn inconvenient, excuse me, ladies. Now, the other thing is, and I saw this at field day last week, and I walked away from anybody who did it. They disconnected their antenna, and they laid it on the ground right inside the tent. Wouldn't do that either because, oh, by the way, the amount of lightning surge current can be in the hundreds of thousands of volts and associated amps. And in fact, what's called step voltage, how much you step away from an area where there's lightning, you don't want to do a big step because you'll have a big voltage difference. You want to take small steps. If you ever get caught in a car that has either power lines on top of it or gets struck by lightning, uh, a couple of things happen. Your car probably stops running. Okay, but two, you could be still energized. And you can sit there inside that car all day long. You just happen to be sitting at uh, 100,000 volts or something, okay? It's just don't step out of the car. Don't step out of the car by leaving one foot in the car and one foot on the ground because the step voltage will kill you. Okay, if you've got to get out of the car, jump out. And don't be touching any metal. You're preferably better. Now, your wheels may have blown. The rubber tires may have blown. But you're still better sitting in the car. By the way, uh, same thing in an air airplane. What happens when an airplane gets hit by lightning? It's nicely charged on the outer surface. Just don't go climb out on the ring when you're flying the airplane when it gets in a lightning strike. Now, the pilots may have some problems because some of their instrumentation can get goofy. 
So going back on the first side of the page and lightning protection, and I really am only going to gloss over this, spend a few bucks, 20 bucks, and buy a surge protector. Note, surge protector is not a lightning protector. A surge protector will, will dissipate uh, surges if they get above a certain voltage, and they'll dissipate them to the ground. So I want to introduce two things. Put a surge arrestor someplace outside of your house, as close to the edge of the house as it is. Don't put it in the attic. If you have to bring that coax cable through the attic, find out where the first point where you touch the... Uh, the building structure, and that's where your surge arrestor goes. Tie your surge arrestor to a lightning ground rod. Not your station ground, but a lightning ground rod. Now, if you're fortunate enough, like Nancy was when we put her station ground in and then put her lightning protection ground, I purposely located, and thank you antenna team, because you did it in such a way that the ground that went to the surge arrestor was more than 50 feet away from the uh, station ground and the home uh, electrical service. And this gets back to the question that was asked over here uh, by Mike about is there impedance associated with lightning? Yes, because of the frequency. Uh, if you get more than 20 to 30 feet distance between your station ground and your lightning protection ground, it's not worth bonding them together because they won't, it, there's too much impedance for current to flow. I personally am of the school that says, I want that lightning guy to stay way, way, way from me. And the rise of the earth, ground voltage, and this is what John was mentioning, <coughs> can raise for the first three or four milliseconds and then essentially dissipate as the surge, if you will, dissipates in the earth. So station ground, Antenna ground. If they're close to one another, you ought to bond them and bond them to the service entrance. If they're separated by 20, the notes say 20 feet, my rule of thumb is 50 feet. There's so much darn impedance, don't waste your copper doing it. Uh, what size copper? As much as you can afford to spend, but don't go anything bigger than number two. I say number six. Uh, number six is, if you will, a size or two larger than everything else inside your house. And that's the logic. I'm not protecting against lightning strikes. I'm assuming that number 14 wire will burn up and be shards of insulation in the yard and in the process absorb a lot of the lightning protection. So I've spent the, af the evening with you talking a little bit about people safety, a little bit about lightning protection of wire antennas. There's more to this checklist. Uh, we did this as a course about two years ago, three of us did four of us did actually, and, and talked about uh, grounding A to Z, including RFI. Those notes are out on the website. Uh, just look up uh, grounding, and you'll see it on the presentation page. Uh, feel free to go through those notes. If you have a question, drop an email. If there's any questions, we have a few minutes before we wrap up for the day. Uh, Lee. Quick one. When you put your surge protector on your antenna, if you have a 50 ohm system, it's good to get ones that basically have a shunt inductor to ground because that actually brings your antenna wire to ground potential at RF. Yeah. Right? And the lower frequencies, basically. I'm sorry, I shouldn't say <laughs> RF. You have the inductance, that, so it's not at RF, but the lower frequencies where it takes most of the energy from the lightning or induced charge from the lightning will flow to ground that way. So that's. You know, when you're, so it's, it's more than just a gas get discharge tube or a, um, other device. Get ones that basically also have a shunt inductor. Yes, and you can go out to the website and you can see that you can spend from $20 to $100. Uh, I happen to uh, be eyeing a manual uh, disconnect, excuse me, an automatic disconnect. And in the automatic disconnect that would be located outside of my house, there'd be a wire that goes to my power supply so that every time I turn off my power supply, it disconnects the antenna automatically and grounds it to earth. When it's operating, it has a uh, shunt inductance uh, gas tube uh, surge arrestor in it so that I have surge arrestor uh, grounding and disconnect all in one box. It's fairly expensive, maybe $250. 
but now I can get away from my coffee mug inside of a of a uh, aluminum trash basket when I think about disconnecting the antenna. Well, you can do there. You know, there's all kind. There's all kinds of products out there. Uh, you can do it electronically. You can do it manually. You can do it electrically. Uh, I happen to have my eye on one that I have looked at, and uh, the reviews on it satisfy me that the guy did it the right way. John. Is forcing the uh, feed line of an antenna to ground uh, increasing the chances you'll get your antenna stuck by left? This is a question. And there's debates in here. And the question uh, was? Ron Payne would tell you that there is a debate here that says, why ground this stuff? Because all it's going to be is a sink for a lightning. Why don't you just let it, uh, let it uh, float? And my reaction is, as long as you can get everything around you to float the same thing voltage-wise that you are. So the point is, do you want this? And this only happens when there's a lightning strike or surge currents flowing through the system. But you don't want your radio to be at this voltage and your lamp that's sitting next to your radio at, at this voltage. And <laughs> you're two, turning the two devices on simultaneously. So you know, maybe one rule of thumb is if you run ungrounded, um, don't operate in a lightning storm. <laughs> now, your question really was, will it attract more electricity because it is grounded? Technically, yes. It's electricity, too. Well, and that's why you have a surge arrestor. And the, the purpose of the surge arrestor is let that. And what's, what's uh, grounding? Remember. <coughs> <coughs> this is basically DC and, and slightly above DC. And so it's not impacting the uh, performance of the, of the radio in its uh, HF operation. In terms of your building protection, where you have, you've got to think about in terms of your building protection, where we intentionally are putting up our little rods and tying them to the ground. You know, we're not trying to attract lightning with them, right? <laughs> right. We're you don't attract lighting, it comes to you, mostly. <laughs> <laughs> so the point is, in terms of grounding things, is to actually try to equalize the charge of your wires and things with the ground, so that you don't have a, this differential, right. which is the same reason um, for large buildings we spend thousands of dollars putting up well, what, I forgot the proper term for it. We used to call them lightning arresters. That's not the right. Yeah, they're called, ter they're called uh, uh, air terminals. terminals. Air terminals. Air terminals, right. OK, I need to cut this a little bit short. Keith. Yeah, you talked, uh, mentioned, uh, as far as I can tell, you not mentioned lightning rods. Yeah, you know in your house? Uh, when you say a lightning rod, you're talking about the thing that would go on the peak of the house? Yeah, well, that's the same thing. Uh, actually, the National Electrical Code requires on buildings above certain uh, stories to have on the roof these kinds of air terminals is what is, a new, is the proper terminology for them. Uh, there's a lot of debate in the industry about uh, should you put uh, lightning protection on houses. Uh, my reaction to this is no. If you live in Virginia where you see a probability of lightning strike 40 times a year, um, let me have a different conversation if you live in Florida where you're talking about 180 and 200 days of possible lightning. Because remember, this is all probabilistic. If you don't have a lot of chance of it, you have a low probability that it's going to hit you. Should you put surge arresters on your antenna? <laughs> <coughs> Excuse me. Should you put surge arresters on your antenna that's in the attic? Uh, the book, the grounding and bonding book by the ARRL says no need to. I disagree with that. I don't care if there's a, it's inside the attic or if it's outside of the attic. The attic isn't going to make a difference for electricity at uh, 4 or 5 megahertz flowing through the attic material. After all, your antenna works, right? So I would say yes. But then I really the comment I really have is then, OK, show me how you're going to ground that surge arrestor. Because if you don't ground it, it's useless. And if you ground it, you may create more havoc with regards to the flow of current down that ground conductor. And oh, by the way, by the time you get to ground, you've probably created such an impedance that nothing flows anyway. So that's why the book is saying no. Uh, <coughs> number four gauge solid copper wire from all my antennas to the roof directly to the ground. 
directly to my uh, copper uh, <coughs> ground rods. Just to be able to, so trying to minimize impedance as much as possible, but just to be able to direct all that current as much of it as I can, uh, that's the least, uh, you know, path of current to that thick uh, copper gauge uh, cable, cable to the ground rather than going through the house. Okay, well, okay, so my opinion is don't waste your money on buying number two uh, wire, grounding conductor wire. Uh, it, it's, it's certainly less resistance. Uh, I would certainly buy uh, number six, that is to say a couple sizes physically larger than your house wiring so that it's better than everything else. Uh, but uh, uh, remember, you're not talking, theoretically, you're not talking about lightning ever getting into the house if you do this right. You want the lightning to, if you will, go from the antenna to the antenna ground. And then if the antenna ground happens to be bonded, uh, then it's bonded directly to the service entrance ground, which is tied to the electrical uh, ground in the power system which is inherently a very good ground. Uh, and so my reaction is, you want to keep lightning away and out of the house. That's why, if you talk to Ron, why Ron doesn't ground things. Because I'm going to keep all that stuff out of the house by not having any possibility that it can get in there. And if lightning wants to get in the house, it's going to get in the house regardless of what I've done or not. I mean, that's your basic philosophy. Just don't have the building inspectors come visit you. Because the building inspectors have a section of the National Electrical Code that's uh, Article 810 about wire antennas. This is mostly for cable television and the like. But uh, it can be, and it is by definition, includes ham radio stations. So the National Electrical Code since about the 19, late 1990s said CCTV and amateur radio stations need to have the following things if they have external antennas keyword external antennas. Now I'm after time, so I'll break here. If I'm certainly not walking out if people have questions. Thanks for coming. This was a cool session. As I said, I really didn't want to do view graphs, but my little checklist uh, will be on the website if I didn't have enough copies to go around the room. So thanks, Mike. So in two weeks, we're going to meet again here one more time for April. And uh, in the meantime, there's lots of fun and activities to be uh, uh, participating in. So stay tuned, folks, and come back. Thanks, everybody, for being here.